Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the second day of Artec seminar uh, at Assembly Summer 2018. My name is Natasha Trug and I am one of the hosts of this year's seminar. So today we are going to start with a uh, talk by Matti Polke from uh, University of Oulu about the VR development. Mat Matti, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Okay, so uh, I'm Matti Poke from University of Oulu, and uh, I'm going to talk about some things that uh, make you puke, or at least they have a high tendency of making you puke. So, uh, yeah, I uh, like, like to study kind of uh, VR development and also kind of a little bit of a kitchen psychology when it comes to VR development. Uh, this other guy, other name over there, is, uh, Professor Steve Laval, he also helped me with this presentation. And, uh, he used to work at Oculus and uh, used to develop the DK1 and DK2 kits. And uh, after talking about his experiences in the de developing the uh, latest VR development, uh, VR hardware, he also kind of inspired me into this topic. So let's get the boring stuff away first. I guess I have to always do this kind of a self-presentation. Yeah, I'm a postdoc at Center for UB Computing, University of Oulu. Um, uh, I have a kind of information processing science background, but uh, I, for, I identify as an engineer, more or less. So I've uh, been doing kind of engineering stuff, um, despite of my background. Uh, you, I went to Japan a couple of times. I was one year in Hokkaido University studying 3D graphics, kind of weather effects, and that kind of stuff. And I also went to Nara Institute of Science and Technology. It's in Kansai area, Japan. I went there twice. I used to study kind of like a human, hu human, human activity recognition and kind of uh, activity capture kind of stuff and transforming that into virtual reality and virtual environments. I mean, I was kind of a check of all trades in uh, 3D graphics. And, uh, but now I recently, a couple of past years, I've been really interested in like cyber sickness and presence and these kind of perceptual and psychological issues in virtual reality. So I guess I have to do some couple of definitions to uh, kind of one of the evils that you have to get out of the way. So uh, the first is uh, like, what is virtual reality? The first is from straight from dictionary. It's an artificial environment experience, experience through sensory stimuli, as sights and sounds provided by computer and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I actually like this uh, Steve's definition more because it's kind of a technology agnostic. So inducing virtual reality is inducing targeted behavior in an organism by using artificial sensory stimulation while the organism has little or no awareness of the interference. interference. So uh, I like this, it kind of keeps virtual reality, like uh, it doesn't define computers or HMDs or that kind of stuff. So virtual reality can be something, something completely diff different also. So, uh, like uh, targeted behaviors, is, so virtual reality, it gets you to do something. The purpose of the application is usually, it has some, some kind of a thing. It, maybe it's exploration, flying, uh, or gaming, shooting somebody. So it's, uh, the application usually has some, some kind of a purpose. It's a targeted behavior, it wants you to do something. And the organism, well, usually it's as humans, users of virtual reality, but it can be something else. It can be a fruit fly, cockroach, fish, anything, and uh, we has been done all, for all of these. And then this uh, artificial sensory stimulation is something that uh, we fool our sense organs, sensors, human sensors, through some kind of uh, engineering, some kind of doohickeys, maybe HMD, so sound, smells, something like that. And finally, the awareness, which is itself uh, another, another kind of worms in uh, VR studies, uh, the kind of a presence and plausibility, how you, how, uh, the illusion that you are actually somewhere else and uh, that you are kind of a, at least willingly kind of want to be in the virtual reality, virtual environment and kind of react as if it was a real place. Of course, on a conscious level, you'll never realize that it's, uh, you, you, you're not completely immersed. You, you will know that you're sitting there in some kind of chair or walking in a room or something, but you at least want to or kind of uh, immerse yourself into virtual reality. And uh, just a picture over there. So uh, that's actually a rodent in there uh, using virtual reality. So uh, 
the road is like uh, running on a treadmill over there, and uh, because he he receives some visual stimuli that he see on a treadmill and so on. Uh, it's a, uh, I think it was done in uh, uh, Princeton University. Yeah, Princeton University. So to do some uh, this kind of uh, animal experiment, virtual reality. So it can be done not only to humans but uh, to other kind of, especially in research, it can be done to all, all kind of organisms. And so yeah, it's um, VR is not that new even. It's not a, uh, it took place way before Oculus. So uh, we had Sensorama over there. It's like a really, really old, old timey thing. And uh, and I guess uh, much of this stuff that I'm even talking here right now, uh, during this uh, presentation, uh, was actually came from U.S. military, uh, Navy uh, stuff made for like military pilots. Because uh, in the early days uh, of flight training, uh, the uh, people soon realize that it's actually cheaper to make people drive on, uh, fly with simulators instead of real airplanes, it's safer, it takes uh, less useless fuel and that kind of stuff. And it also kind of uh, gave the birth to the, like, uh, the study of this uh, sickness, motion sickness experiences in, uh, uh, during virtual reality. So um, it's been, uh, Throughout time, the uh, so VR has been going on for decades, and uh, even like after simulators, it's been used for therapy uh, in like a medical, medical and military fields. Especially, it's it's been used for kind of uh, treating post tra post traumatic stress disorders and that kind of stuff. But uh, nowadays, uh, a couple of past years, we've been like uh, being able to enjoy this consumer consumer level VR hardware, so we can actually use VR at home pretty cheaply in a way, like not not. Dreadfully, it, uh, it's not dreadfully expensive, but uh, the issues have been kind of the same still. So these are usually the three things when uh, what people at least seem to me complain about when when using virtual reality is like uh, so resolution and wires and cyber sickness. So uh, it's where you're entangled in wires when using uh, using VR hardware, and then the resolution is what it is. It's still it's uh, better than it has been ever been before, and the uh, Display technology has advanced a great bit, but you're still, uh, in essence, you're watching a cell phone uh, from like a couple of centimeters distance, and also you're using a magnifying lens while you're looking at the display. So we're still, for some time, we're gonna. And uh, but uh, well, this new development is coming coming pretty fast. Oh, there's Wario and everything. Maybe maybe we will soon get some kind of a, maybe Fourier vision or something that, like the vision that tracks your eyes and uh, kind of uh, getting the, uh, uh, like using, using this eye tracking to kind of take care that uh, the most sharpest thing is where you're actually focusing and, and so forth. And uh, then there's of course this, uh, that uh, it makes you sick. It can make you sick. Um, so, um, we're kind of also. I think they're, they're already there. The wire, wireless coming, wireless stuff is coming, and uh, resolution we're getting there. But this uh, cyber sickness, actually, technology-wise, we are being there already. In the old days of uh, VR, uh, the cyber sickness effect was m much because of that. Uh, there were latency, uh, latency problems when you, when you were turning your head. Then uh, the tracking wasn't so smooth that it actually the picture came a little bit. Uh, behind you, that kind of stuff, and also it was maybe the uh, frame rate was bad. It was kind of uh, laggy and twitchy, and everything is working uh, properly and with lags. But nowadays, actually, the technology is kind of starting to get there. Uh, the tracking latencies are really, really so small with uh, modern kind of uh, uh, filtering techniques. Um, so it's it's not not that much of a hardware issue anymore, but it's it has become a design issue. So it's more of like how you design your applications. Because uh, you can also make really comfortable applications with modern technology, and it's it's not really the VR headset's fault uh, if you're starting to get sick. So um, this kind of uh, this three kind of, uh, when the early early military researchers kind of uh, categorized this um, uh, VR sickness into three categories called like uh, disorientation, something like feeling of vertigo that. You feel like when uh, you're kind of tripping over, your sense of balance is hindered. 
an ocular motor, uh, which means kind of eye strain and headache kind of stuff. It's, uh, it makes your eyes hurt and it makes your head hurt. And also nauseogenic, that's uh, kind of a the thing that what makes you puke. So um, uh, in the, uh, uh, the cyber sickness was called, simu called simulator sickness uh, during the time of military, military simulators. And uh, it has kind of a little bit different uh, symptom profile than cyber sickness. It's a little bit more eye strain and headache and cyber sickness is a little bit more like disorientation and nauseogenic. But basically they're all there like uh, cyber sickness, simulator sickness, space sickness, sea sickness, motion sickness, travel sickness. They're kind of uh, more or less the same. Uh, symptoms are a little bit different. Like uh, I think in travel sickness you're more prone to puke. In cyber sickness it's fortunately only like 1% or 2% of users that might actually vomit when, when using VR. And, uh, but of course we can avoid even that with uh, designing our applications in a nice way. So uh, one of the well, other terms you might also hear about VINs called uh, visually induced motion sickness. It's kind of there on the same. So uh, basically what it does is uh, usually the cyber sickness, it uh, uh, comes to most often some kind of uh, sensory mismatch. So we actually have more senses, that's five, five senses, besides like uh, sight and hear and uh, smell and taste and touch. We also have a uh, proprioception, like uh, where are, you know where your hands and legs are. You know, like uh, you can feel them, like even if you don't see them. And you have the uh, sense of balance, of course, and uh, we also have accelerometers, and uh, accelerometers inside of our ears. And they actually have like, a, they have three axes kind of like in uh, like physical accelerometers built by engineers. So we can sense acceleration. And uh, especially when it comes to this kind of motion sickness uh, stuff in VR, uh, it's a thing that it's a mismatch between our, our vision and uh, our vestibular system. So uh, I usually at this point, uh, I saw once this uh, guy called Bernhard Rieke used this video when explaining this effect of action. So I, I also like to use this video the same time. So it's an effect called vection. So uh, what, what, what takes place when you uh, go into a virtual reality system and you start to move in the system, you're sitting still on your, uh, on your chair or standing up and then, uh, uh, but in virtual you start, mo you start moving. So something like this happens. So yeah, so you're not actually moving, uh, but your brain thinks that you're moving. So, so that's an effect called vection, and it's something that usually always takes place before uh, you start to get this kind of uh, cyber sickness, motion sickness effect. Um, there's some, um, and you, it has to do with optical flow. So vection, it's, it's a sensation of, um, sensation of self movement caused by visual stimuli, and. Uh, so as I said, it's uh, usually it's uh, related. Uh, it happens. Uh, you you get a sense of vexation before you get sick, uh, at least when it comes to nauseogenic uh, cyber sickness. So uh, problem usually it becomes a kind of a travel locomotion navigation problem. How do you move around in uh, virtual reality then, and not to get sick? Of course, when it comes to oculomotor symptoms like eye strain and headache, then it's a kind of a different different thing. It has to more of to do with your eye, eyes accommodating and. Uh, yeah, there's also this uh, virgin's accommodation issues that uh, you're kind of a focusing things that are far away, uh, although the um, actual screen is really close, so that causes eye strain. Yeah, it's called virgin's accommodation mismatch. Uh, but um, quite often it's uh, this uh, the thing that wants to make you puke, it's uh, because of some kind of a moment, virgin kind of thingy. So this kind of debate, like, uh, can we? Some there are researchers that even try to utilize, they try to make self movement, and they kind of claim that it's not the vection itself, but it's something different. It's like a heart accelerations or maybe postural sway or something like that. Usually, people kind of start to sway before they get sick. So, is that swaying making you sick, or is it? Are you starting to sway because you get sick? It's uh, kind of a, so still some unanswered questions in there. And um, people, we are in a VR community. We are often engineers and not, not medical doctors or neuroscientists. Also, many kind of want to be psychologists as well. But uh, so, uh, 
that's the, uh, we should, uh, I think we should like definitely increase cooperation also with the uh, kind of medical and neuroscientist field in this. But anyway, it's, uh, nevertheless, it's the optical flow that usually kind of affects uh, your, your experience and makes this, this kind of uh, mismatch between the optical flow and your uh, vestibular stimulus is that makes you sick. And uh, there's even so the kind of automatic methods. People uh, have developed ways to kind of analyze scene content and uh, is it something that will make you sick? Is there like features moving? Something that you will sense in your peripheral vision that makes you uh, sense the movement. And uh, that's kind of something that I want to also look into in the future. Actually, I do have a bachelor's student working on it right now. And uh, it's, that's really interesting stuff. So then of course you can uh, <coughs> think maybe maybe you can like kind of simulate the uh, uh, acceleration some somehow like why don't you like uh, when you move you can cause some kind of acceleration so yeah it's been done as well so this is uh, from Max Planck Institute of uh, Biological Cybernetics uh, really cool cyberpunk kind of name for the place so um, that's actually there's a guy sitting there in that um, um, inside the thingy over there on the top, and uh, he's uh, seeing some kind of visual stimuli for driving a car, and then the uh, robot is trying to cause some accelerations that would match the visual flow, then that he would get similar kind of a vestibular stimuli as in, as in a driving a real car. So that's definitely one way to do it. So um, there's kind of a also, disagreements, uh, if this actually works, some, some research papers say that it actually just makes things worse. But it also kind of looks like that if the, uh, uh, this kind of acceleration stuff is good enough, then it, uh, it will work if it's, uh, like there's no latency also between the movements and the visual stimuli. Then uh, it, it should work more or less. And then there's also uh, kind of a new version of the same thing. That's uh, kind of a version 2 of the previous. It's kind of a little more uh, subtle working in this kind of a spider thingy over there. So you can uh, go there, sit in the cockpit, and be immersed in VR. And then uh, this, uh, with, with this installation, you can then uh, get some different kind of uh, uh, stimuli for acceleration. And what was kind of a bummer that they didn't let us try these things. I really wanted to write that one. But uh, unfortunately, we, we could only see this uh, demonstration presentation. So, yeah, I bet it would be really cool to like uh, sit in one of those and use VR. I might have to convince my professor that we have to buy one of those. So. Uh. But yeah, anyway, uh, it might be that uh, yes, we we don't have access to those kind of thingies uh, like. Uh, Usually, as a virtual reality users, we don't have these these things in our living rooms. So, uh, of, of course, there are simpler things. Uh, you've probably seen some videos for this kind of racing controllers, racing platforms also, that you kind of make you turn a little bit. Those kind of things do exist, but uh, maybe you don't have one. And uh, especially as an application developer, maybe you don't know if your users have one. And uh, also, Steve wanted to, uh, especially wanted, <laughs> wanted to add that they might, you might get sick anyway. Maybe that kind of motion is enough to make you sick. So um, anyway, there are some, some what to do, what, what do we, what can we do? So uh, well, uh, the gaming industry has seemed to like uh, caught up pretty quickly. It's not such of a shock anymore as it was a couple of years ago when we are game. So like, don't move virtually at all. Just uh, use kind of a room scale VR. You can move around in a room and then uh, if you have to move large, Distances, then you, you do some kind of teleportation mechanism that takes you there instantly. Sometimes uh, it's uh, you can control freely, or there's some some predefined waypoints uh, in there. But then again, uh, maybe maybe your application is a car simulator, a driving simulator, something like that. So then you cannot use teleportation, that kind of stuff, or, or for some other reasons, you just have to move. So then then you you can do something else instead. But that's kind of a sure way, of course, like. Uh, We've been running some experiments when like, even these old people, little elderly old ladies have been using VR for like 90 minutes in a row and using only teleportation and they didn't get sick at all. No, no kind of negative effects. Only when they were in some kind of high place, uh, they might have 
experience a little bit like vertigo or disorientation, but as, as of, um, otherwise than that, then like uh, nobody did really complain. You still, you just, uh, they did complain about the movement itself. Like they asked, why, why cannot they move normally? Why do they have to teleport? But, uh, but it didn't make them sick. And uh, there's other obvious stuff, like don't mess with orientation. Like uh, the up direction should be where, where it actually is. If you kind of tilt uh, your, uh, uh, your scene so that it's, it's kind of twisted like this, you will definitely know, you will know it for sure. Uh, if it's a uh, sense of up, it's not, not where it should be. And there's, of course, uh, training and adaptation. Uh, if you just immerse, use virtual reality applications long enough, eventually you will get used to it. At least most people do. But then again, it's, maybe it's not possible. Maybe it's uh, some user, they don't have the time. You have to use it instantly for some kind of training. Or otherwise, it also kind of essentially means that it means reprogramming your brains. And... Uh, Especially with, um, it, it makes it, uh, you will teach your brains to accept the kind of stimuli that they are not used to, used to handle. They can do that, but for example, for like, like kids, teenagers, young, young, um, <clears throat> young people who have a high neuroplasticity, um, we don't really know yet uh, how it will affect them in the long run. Like, um, it might, is there some development, like if you teach your brains to accept virtual reality stimuli when you're a kid, does it do something you as an adult? We don't know it yet, uh, but uh, we need more information about that. So um, other stuff, uh, well, you can make the external conditions pleasant. So that kind of stuff helps. Good music helps if it's uh, something that you kind of uh, subjectively like. Uh, if you like Cannibal Corpse, then you should listen to Cannibal Corpse. It's, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be classical music or anything like that. It uh, distracts you kind of, and a uh, couple of beers also help. A couple of German colleagues found that. It's also and uh, nice temperature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you can utilize airflow, like in uh, uh, like in a car. You can just put on some some airflow. It it uh, will make you less sick, similarly as when driving a car. You can also restrict user movement a little bit and even apply vibrations to head. But these are all kind of these kind of external conditions that. Maybe, maybe as a developer, you don't have, you don't know if your users are doing this or not. So, um, as a user, you can do something like this. But uh, of course, when you're doing VR content for somebody else, then you don't necessarily know know if your users are gonna like uh, do this or not. So, um, you 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 have you have some kind of uh, tips and tricks as well. You can you can do some smaller compromises in the content. So. Um, this is our beautiful campus at the University of Oulu, at this uh, virtual reality representation of it. Uh, we have some of these uh, large virtual reality spaces that uh, I like to use in experiments. So um, this, um, I'm gonna run a couple of cybersecurity experiments in here, and I'm gonna use this image to show some kind of examples of what you can do. Sorry that I forgot the light, it's an editor screenshot, so there's a couple of light bulbs in there, but don't worry about those. So. Um, yeah, like as for ocular motor symptoms, you can do some uh, depth of field blur. It seems to reduce the uh, eye strain that you get from uh, virgin's accommodation mismatch. Uh, that's one thing you can do. And uh, you can re uh, reduce the field of view. So because we sense movement uh, according to our peripheral vision, uh, if we see movement here, uh, we think that we move. If we like restrict that vision, then uh, the sensation of movement is not that strong anymore, and uh, it's been shown in several research papers, and also, uh, you can do it also in a kind of subtle way, uh, like I start bringing it when, uh, and during movement, and uh, well, you probably, you, you might have seen this in computer games already, uh, in modern video games, it's like uh, industry has been catching up on this pretty good, pretty well, and uh, then maybe this kind of so-called rest frame, bird cage effect, uh, you provide a kind of a frame that matches your kind of inertial environment that there's some the kind of environment moves behind that frame it seems to really reduce cyber sickness so it kind of uh, somehow kind of anchors you into your actual actual environment and uh, something that I'm been dabbling on recently is uh, kind of used post-processing filtering to reduce 
a small detail from the environment so that uh, there's less less motion cues for you to catch on. So because they're not not so much small stuff moving in the environment, it makes you that you don't get the sense of movement. It's not so sh strong. Uh, but then again, you're like. Uh, I don't want to ruin the VR experience. It's like uh, all, all these things look like crap. I, like, I don't want to use this. It's, uh, but uh, you can be a kind of a subtle, subtle also in this. Uh, uh, when, when doing this, and uh, it's kind of uh, sometimes useful to look at some, some stuff on immersion, resonance, and plausibility. So, uh, Mel Slater's definitions on, uh, on these three, like, uh, when, when in uh, research literature, when you are talking about these uh, immersive as aspects of VR, it's usually immersion means kind of the technical capabilities of the system, resolution and, uh, and tracking system and that kind of stuff. And then the uh, presence uh, means like, does it feel like a real place? It's a so-called place illusion. Uh, when, when you go somewhere else, does it feel like that you're actually in, in some other place, more or less? And then the uh, plausibility means, like, does the system respond in a realistic way? Like, uh, if I touch this bottle over here, or I, I try to grab this bottle, can I grab this bottle? Does it? And uh, if I look at somebody, are they looking back at me? Like, if I bump into somebody, are they like reacting and that kind of stuff? Plausibility doesn't really have that much to do with cyber sickness. You can do any of those, regardless of like, uh, uh, regardless of like what kind of graphics you utilize and that kind of stuff. It's uh, more of uh, the interaction capabilities of your system and not, not so much of a uh, cyber sickness issue. Uh, but uh, as for presence, you might feel like, what about if uh, these kind of uh, crappy graphics, even during the movement or something like, uh, does, it, does this like reduce the place illusion? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, there's been some uh, prior experience. There was this kind of, uh, for example, this kind of chasm experience. People were had to uh, navigate across a room where there was a huge pit, and uh, they kind of observe if the users are gonna like uh, go past the pit or if they are just walking on the top of the pit because they don't fall now anyway because it's virtual reality. So they found that in that particular experiment, at least the graphics didn't any didn't do any difference. If it was a wireframe graphics or like uh, highly textured, uh, like modern graphics, it's uh, modern at the time. Uh, it didn't really matter. But uh, your self-representation did matter. Like, uh, if, you were if you visualize your own avatar, your own hands and legs and movements, that definitely did affect on the presence and uh, if they were dodging the pit or not. So it's, um, the uh, graphics, uh, like the graphics fidelity, if it's uh, like a tunish graphics or like a wireframe kind of stuff, doesn't necessarily matter in terms of presence. But of course it helps. If it looks nice, it uh, helps for sure. And, uh, as for plausibility, that uh, kind of makes makes it also feel, feel like a real place. Then it doesn't even matter like whether you're moving or not, or whether you, the graphics are nice and that kind of. And uh, also, there's some ka other kind of stuff you can do as well, like uh, as a rest frame. Like uh, if you want to utilize rest frames, you don't have to do anything like this. Um, instead, you can uh, use a cockpit. Uh, because it acts as a rest frame as, like, as well. Uh, I don't know, car, helicopter, it can be some kind of helmet, maybe it's kind of a, something that puts a kind of frame, some, some kind of something for you to kind of anchor yourself on during a VR experience. Um, that's, by the way, that's a Kiji Virtual Museum, one of our virtual reality environments. It doesn't actually have any roads in there, and probably the museum administrators would get mad at me if I went to drive a car in there, but anyway, um, so yeah, dashboard, cockpits, helmets, they can be utilized as, a re uh, as rest frames, and uh, they can also use to restrict your field of view. So I was really surprised when trying the wipeout VR version myself. I thought that the uh, wipeout would be like the most, like you know, probably this, uh, game where you race with in the future with really, really fast cars and futuristic landscapes. And uh, I thought it would be probably the worst possible experience for VR. <clears throat> but it was actually pretty nice. It was, uh, it had a cockpit and also uh, the kind of cockpit also kind of blocked your side view as well. So you couldn't see like uh, peripheral vision uh, was blocked by these doors. 
and uh, the acceleration was like really insanely fast. You just went from zero to, I don't know, gazillion miles per hour in an instant. So I guess, so it doesn't, and the movement was so fast that it doesn't, doesn't actually like cause you anymore. With this insane of movement, uh, when combined with, combined with all these uh, tricks with cockpits, it was surprisingly comfortable. And uh, another thing is like rest frames, they seem to work even if they go unnoticed. Uh, one, uh, there was this one, one uh, experiment regarding using a virtual nose uh, as a rest frame. So um, researchers actually rendered a huge, huge nose on front of the, uh, uh, in, in the vision. And then, then they uh, ran uh, this kind of roller coaster experiment. So people went on a roller coaster and uh, they measured their like, levels of cyber sickness. And uh, well, it did reduce, the virtual nose did reduce the effect of cyber sickness. But also uh, what was more surprising was that uh, the users did not, did not even notice that the nose was there. Uh, even though in, when you look at it in the screen such, it's like really, really obvious nose, big, big honker on the screen, but the uh, users didn't see it. Because uh, we also see our own nose all the time, uh, but our brain blocks it. So uh, our brain usually blocks our real nose and apparently it also blocks your virtual nose as well. So um, I think they, they even patented that stuff, it was so, they were so astonished by this finding. So uh, you don't actually even consciously have to see uh, these rest frames uh, in order to make them work. Um, as of some other stuff, um, like uh, just this so-called passenger symptom, uh, if you're in control of your own movements, you can usually get less sick, you're, you don't get that, that sick. Um, like um, it's same as in cars, usually passengers in, in cars get sick and drivers get less sick, it's same with virtual environment. But also, it, if you use it in a kind of sparing and a predictable way, it uh, certainly helps like uh, in VR Domo where, where there are these like really, really obvious kind of trampolines. If you go there, you know that you're gonna jump and you go there and well, it's not so bad. It's, uh, you know it's gonna happen and there's gonna be a, like a, some small moment, so it's not so bad. But if it's like a really surprising, it's, it might be more shocking. And also, uh, the speed does seem to matter, like, uh, and accelerations and decelerations. Like in this wipeout experiment uh, example, it seems that the rotation makes you sick. If you rotate on a spot, it makes you uh, way more sick than moving forwards. And also, there's some research papers that found that they actually really, really small movement, slow movements don't necessarily matter. And also, like, really, really super fast if it's just kind of blur the environment they also seem to be kind of comfortable. So I guess that kind of also explains the wipeout thingy, that the super fast movements are kind of, uh, some, somehow they just work. Maybe your brains don't even know that you, you can move so fast to it, so I don't know. <laughs> Have to look into it, like, for the reason. And also, this kind of, uh, <clears throat> there's these things, like, really futuristic stuff, like uh, redirected walking, that uh, you kind of artificially increase the space in which you walk in room scale we are. So you can use kind of utilize you know, gain, small gains that when you walk a little bit like this, you actually move faster in virtual reality. Um, but there's also you have to kind of be careful not to overdo it, and also maybe you don't want to put any gain in side steps, but just only forwards. And uh, there are even techniques where you can kind of rotate the environment, so you kind of walk onto the edge of the room, and the uh, virtual reality system kind of gives you a warning that you're now on an actual wall. You just kind of a Rotate like this, your virtual scene stays put, but you rotate in reality and then you like walk, walk in the room, but in virtual reality you're like walking a long corridor or something like that. Um, Travel is, they kind of require pretty, pretty large rooms in the first place. So if you have a, in a really cramped space, you cannot really utilize that because you, then you have to like rotate it all the time. But maybe some, something that you, uh, can be looked, about, uh, looked into and maybe it starts to appear in uh, commercial applications later on, maybe. Uh, time will tell. And uh, there's also like, uh, you can also use kind of rotational, kind of make users to swerve a little bit like this, that they're like walking a small circle, even though in virtual reality they're walking, walking forwards all the time. Uh, that can be done as well. And, uh, and also this kind of locomotion navigation things that they are really interesting. And uh, 
so kind of wrapping up. So as a, if you use VR system, you can change your external conditions, but as a developer, you don't have that chance. But maybe you can change the application content too. There's like kind of small, subtle things, small compromises go a long way in reducing cyber sickness. And uh, visual detail is not the only thing that matters in regards of patience and plausibility. And you have this is just a, like a small, small subset, a uh, small, small part of. A little bit of examples what can be done, and uh, probably lots of more things can be done, and uh, it's interesting stuff to study on. And uh, we also have, uh, actually, if you're interested in studying these kind of things, we have a, a PhD student position open. This uh, professor Steve Laval, uh, who used to work at Oculus, he now started at our university, and he's hiring PhD students right now. And uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can look it, uh, look it up from our university webpage, or you can even throw me an email. And you can also throw me emails if you want to just ask. Talk about these things uh, in more detail. And uh, of course, you're very welcome to ask any questions right now, if you have any questions. So I think this concludes my talk. Thank you, Miko. All right, so questions, comments? Anyone? No? All right. Thank you, Miko, very much. Thank you. Your scene, your station. Scene Set Radio. Orbiting the scene. <laughs>